What's up everybody? This is Justin K. Prim. It's February 2021. We are moving into year two of lockdown. And from our point of view here in Bangkok, it's not looking like we're gonna have too many visitors and guests coming to see the Gem District here in Bangkok. So I thought it would be fun to give a little walking history of the Gem Trade in Bangkok, check out some of the shops, some of the streets, some of the neighborhood, and just see what it's like today and see a little bit about what it used to be like back in the day. If you've ever been to the gym district here in Bangkok and you've seen how big it is and how much of a role it plays in the world's gym trade, you might be surprised to find out that it actually hasn't been here for that long. The story of Bangkok as the hub of the world's gemstone trade is actually quite a recent one. If we want to look back into the history of Bangkok and the history of the gem trade here on Siloam and in the Bangrak district, we don't need to go back that far. So going back to the 1950s, there wasn't too much going on around here. And from people that I've talked to, it looked quite different than it does today. There was a lot less buildings, a lot more natural area greenery, still some of the native Thailand jungle environment that we see when we go outside of the city. But a lot of that changed in the 1960s. Some of it had to do with the fact that the change of the Burmese government meant that the borders were closed and the world's source for rubies was suddenly really limited. So I thought if we want to understand the gem district, then we need to get some inside information from somebody who lived through it. So I called my good friend Henry Ho, who was one of the visionaries of the Jewelry Trade Center. So let's go in and see what Henry has to say. The military government nationalized everything. So there was no private industry. You know, and that was a flea, I mean, people, that were educated or had some assets, they had to leave. Many people left Burma, the Burmese border was closed, and the world needed to find a new source for rubies. It was around this time that they really started to mine the deposits around Chantaburi and Pai Lin, and the era of Thai rubies fully began. Now, aside from this new availability of Thai rubies, there was also a lot of money and tech coming into Thailand in the mid-1960s into the mid-1970s. So you have new infrastructure coming in, new technology, new investments, which means more businesses were coming, more infrastructure was being built up, and much of what we find today in Bangkok's gem district and in Thailand in general started to happen around that time. It was a very slow process, and it was a period where the trade really opened up. Uh, everything took place around New Road. One of the first streets that the gym district started to bloom around was New Road, otherwise known as Chereng Krung. From Chereng Krung, the district spread a little bit further into the Mahisok streets. But even today, when we walk down Chereng Krung, we can still find a host of silver shops, export-only wholesale shops, jewelry manufacturers, and of course, tons of delicious street food. Slowly grew, Thailand was more open. Uh, the cutting industry uh, gradually grew. Some people started to go to Australia to buy the rough. So the cutting industry uh, grew very rapidly. And then, uh, then we moved from New Road to Silom Road. And then more people started looking at the Mahesak area and the Mahesak area slowly grew. Now in these early days, there weren't very many buildings around the neighborhood for business to happen in. You have a lot of small family-owned shop houses that are just on some of the smaller streets, but there were two small office buildings for the gem trade at that time. One of them was the Rama building, and then another one was right across the street, the Sita building. So these were really the first two buildings. And you can see even by the front of the building, we've got 1960 as kind of the origin date. So we can kind of have an idea that the 60s were really where the Thai industry began its journey. So once the trade started to migrate a bit outside of Chereng Krung, we start seeing a lot of family-owned shop houses in the Mahisak Soys. 
So the first few blocks off of Siloam are Mahisak 1, Mahisak 2, and Mahisak 3. And here you can find rows of shop houses that are filled with gym dealers, jewelry production, some gem cutting offices, and more. Mahisak has had matured. There was at least like a hundred companies there already. Now the 1970s was also when the Thais first discovered the secret of heat treating rubies. So this also helped the Thai ruby to gain popularity in the world market because suddenly the dark and sometimes included Thai rubies could be heated, lightened, and made to fit into more of the world standard of what they're looking for for rubies. So all of these things together helped Thailand to start to become a center of trade and a hub for cutting and jewelry manufacture for the entire world. While Mahesa grew, my family business also grew. We started from the sixth floor of the Ramachuri building, and we moved to the fifth floor, and then we moved to the fourth floor. The fourth floor was where we had the lab. So in these early days, the Mahisak 1, 2, and 3 were the major center point for the trade. You'd walk around, go from shop to shop, finding what you needed, going from, let's say, gem dealer to jewelry manufacturer to box supply shop. And when we walk down Mahisak today, it doesn't look that different than it did in the 1960s and 70s. As we can see, many of the signs that we find littered around the neighborhood are still those same original signage from the 60s and 70s. The roaring uh, 70s and 80s, uh, if you know Thailand, I mean, if you come three days for a buying trip, uh, at least one day is spent in the car. <laughs> in traffic. To go like a kilometer would take you two hours. The 80s and 90s were a really booming time for the Bangkok gem scene. You've got lots of new customers coming in to place orders from all around the world. You've got brokers coming in from every country, gym dealers coming in and setting up shop, new production, new manufacturing, new factories, new everything. And that definitely means new money. It slowly grew. It slowly grew and it, uh, the cutting grew and the, the manufacturing grew and then, you know, interest from Germany and Italy and Japan and they started setting up uh, company, uh, uh, factories here, jewelry factories here. It just grew and then, of course, when we did the jewelry trade center, our friend uh, Bun Yong started the Jamalpolis, the industrial jewelry estate. So we had a manufacturing base and a trading base. Uh, you know, things really grew exponentially. But one of the problems that was always an issue in Bangkok was congestion. Let's say you came here for just a few days to do your international business, but most of the time spent here was actually stuck in traffic, moving from the gem dealer to the jeweler, to the cutter, to the customs people, to the ASA office, to finally the shipping could take days and days of moving from building to building to building. So it was thought that if all of these things could take place in one spot, one building, that would solve a lot of the problem and make it a lot easier for the international brokers to be able to come here and do what they need to do. The 1990s was when we see really a lot of things change in Bangkok, and a lot of it has to do with the building of what has become now the heart of the Bangkok Gem District, which is the JTC, as you can see behind me. And when this came up, this was the largest piece of land on the most important street. It was a big deal. <laughs> it was a good period because uh, you didn't have to be smart. You just had to be there. Everything was like going up. So once the building had been finished, the vision really was realized. A 58-floor skyscraper where you could literally do all your business in one place. You could see the gem dealer, buy your stones, visit the customs office, go see the jeweler, buy your boxes, and finally take it all to the shipping agent to get it back home, all without ever having to go into a taxi, endure the heat, or get stuck in traffic. Today, the JTC acts as the heart of the Siloam gem neighborhood in Bangkok. You've got the bulk of the gem district in one place all together, making it very easy to get business done, whether you're on a quick schedule or whether you live here all the time, just makes life a little bit easier. 
The first five floors are an open air mall full of gym traders, gym buyers, gym brokers. And the upper floors are private offices for brokers and dealers that you can visit by appointment. One of the highlights is the basement floor, which is chock full of gym traders, back to back to back, lining the walls, lining the aisles, lining the entire floor. And you can find pretty much anything you'd want to find all down there. One other bonus of the JTC is the fact that there's a food court in the back full of all kinds of delicious goodies from Thailand and other Southeast Asian countries. I might even need something to help me get to the end of this video. When I was doing my building, there were like at least three, four other similar buildings. Yeah, but uh, not this tall, not this big, I guess. So after the JTC was built, we have even more buildings popping up around the neighborhood in order to facilitate the massive growth that was going on between now and then. So we have Gym Tower, the Bangkok Gym and Jewelry Center, and of course the JTC, three big buildings, plus all of the small family-owned shop houses in the Mahisak Soys, which still exist today, as well as the Rama building and the Sita building, and a few other smaller buildings around the neighborhood. So as we can see, the trade and the neighborhood have been growing and growing and growing ever since its start in the 1960s. Another important building besides the towers that hold Bangkok's gym traders is the BIS building, which is a crucial place for jewelry manufacturing. So this is a small mall and a tower full of wax carvers, 3D modelers, casters, brokers, and more. If you really study all the countries in the world, Thailand is quite, quite okay in terms of cost of living, standard of living, people, the kind, gentle, mostly, yeah. Good food. Good food, yeah. A lot of natural places, you know, scenery, etc. So Bangkok isn't just a place to come and do business. It's also a place to come and get educated. Inside the JTC, we have AIGS, the first gemology school in Asia. And then if we head all the way down to the other end of the neighborhood, we've got GIA giving their GG course. In the middle of the neighborhood, we have the GIT building, which hosts GMA's FGA program. And then down the street from the JTC, we have our cutting school, IGT, where you can come and learn how to cut gemstones in the heart of the Thai gem district. Even today, Bangkok remains one of the most important gem hubs for the colored stone trade. Whether you need to buy stones, have them cut, or have them set into jewelry, Bangkok is still one of the most valuable cities for the colored stone trade. In fact, we have more labs in Bangkok than anywhere else in the world, so if you need a stone identified with a report, then you will find a multitude of options here. Once the city really started booming, you found people from all over the world coming here. And today, you can literally find people from every gym producing country and every gym consuming country all meeting in one place to do business quickly and easily. Some of my favorite spots in Bangkok are, of course, the supply shops for the lapidary trade. We're lucky enough to have several shops around the neighborhood that we can buy all of the tools for gem cutting. One of my favorites is wool jewelry tools. We also have Sachi, which provides a great amount of laps, diamond powder, gemology tools, and really all the stuff you need to be able to cut and polish stones, as well as look at gemstones, package your jewelry, and really most of the kinds of stuff that you would need to run a jewelry business. Finally, we have Somset, the Thai company that manufactures and sells Thai fastening machine, as well as heat treatment supplies, lapidary supplies, gemology tools, and more. I spoke to some longtime business people here in Bangkok to ask them, what has changed in the last 10 or 20 years? And almost everyone told me that really everything has changed. So much has changed from the trains to the new buildings and even a cultural shift. Even now during the COVID days, the trade still runs. You still have much of the world's jewelry manufacturing taking place here in Bangkok. And it's still true that a good percentage of the world's colored stones at some point in their life move through Thailand in order to get cut and polished and sent back out into the world for the world's jewelry production needs. If we look at the Bangkok district today, we find much of what we always have seen here. A thriving district full of gem traders, brokers, jewelry manufacturers, gem cutters, laboratories, supply shops, and more. 
really everything the world needs to do their gemstone business. We still have people coming from all over the world to buy and sell, to do heat treatments, to export, to import, to cut stones, and send them out to their customers around the world. So Bangkok really is still the home of the world's colored stone gem trade, and it really is the hub that the rest of the world's trade revolves around. So I hope you guys enjoyed a little walk through Bangkok, whether it's a place you've been year after year to do business, or just some place that's been on your list of things to do. You definitely should come check it out, the center of the world's gemstone trade. This has been Justin K. Prim, your friend and tour guide, sweating out here in Bangkok. Catch you next time, see you later. Can I ask all your friends to share? Share, 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 right? <laughs>